before you leave today, you're going to get to see our new track. If you don't know what a track is, it's a real short gospel message. Actually, this one doesn't have the gospel in it, but it tells them where they can get the gospel. And so we're going to talk about this a little bit later, uh, a little bit more, but it is an awesome tool. I told y'all we were going to be doing that after we got the Fidelity ones passed out. So y'all did a great job on that, by the way. Give yourself a hand clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. One person came in during the week and picked up the, all the ones that were left and went and passed them all out. So they're out. We're going to see a couple of things the next Wednesday nights that'll be really awesome for you. This week, we're going to be doing a movie about the Hubble telescope and the awe of God that we've been talking about. We're going to go into the arm of God. And Pastor Kelly will tell you a little bit more about that. That's going to be this week. And then the following week, we're going to show a documentary that is phenomenal. It's an hour and a half documentary. It's not, you know, the Christian films that are out, you know, like Courageous and Fireproof. There's a couple of brothers that do those. They've done a documentary. And this one's Show Me the Father. Um, Doc was, and I were talking the other day, and he told me about the movie. I've watched it. It is fantastic plus. It shows, uh, I, I'm not going to tell you too much about it because I want you to get the same bang I got out of it. But it's going to be great. We're going to have... Brad's special uh, flavored anointed popcorn and soft drinks, and um, gonna have a good time. So uh, you you'll want to make room for that. Bring somebody with you. Anybody will enjoy it, uh, Christian or not. I mean, it's uh, it's just so awesome about people's lives. So it's a documentary. Everything in it's true. The two brothers that do those movies actually did this one, and their dad's in it. And they talk about the family and some of the issues. Their granddad was kind of messed up and their father broke that and passed on to them the lineage of Jesus Christ and so forth and so on. So that's going to be super, super good. Now, make sure you're here next week. Doc Ely, who some of you know, how many of you remember Doc when he was here two years ago? Okay. Um, He's going to be here Sunday morning next week sharing gospel message of some kind. It'll be extremely encouraging, so you want to be sure to be here for that. He's actually going, he and Kelly are going over to uh, ORU the following week to have to do with the uh, accreditation part of ORU that they accredit schools, which uh, Kelly's school that he's uh, ministering at, (coughs) teacher, excuse me, (coughs) teaching at. To, To minister means to serve, so he's a serving teacher. He, he and Doc have been co- cooking up some things that they do with their high school juniors and seniors. And Doc's presenting that to the whole ORU uh, group of schools. So he's going to be here. Kelly's picking him up at 7.30 a.m. next Sunday morning in Tulsa as he hits the ground from the airplane, soft landing, and then bring him here, and he's going to be with us Sunday morning, and then I'm going to be running back to Tulsa Sunday afternoon. So he's really uh, taking this opportunity to come in, and that way we don't have to pay the airfare and everything. So really awesome. If you don't know Doc, you're missing a big thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he's coming by himself this time. Char's not going to be with him, his wife. But uh, Doc is one of the board members of Church of Tomorrow, and we're going to be doing a special ordination as ordaining him as an elder for this church. Yeah. So that's going to be a special time, too, yeah. that we can enjoy that. So yeah. be here. Doc Ely, uh, he's been in all backgrounds of ministry. You name it, he's done. He's been a therapist. He's been an interim pastor. He worked with Billy Graham uh, people for years. Uh, he's phenomenal. And uh, he's been my coach for five or six years. And so we're looking forward to uh, being here with a few of you. Uh, our staff members have got the opportunity to meet him on Zoom. So uh, anyway, that's a great opportunity next week. And he will bless you, I promise. He'll bless everybody in here except those two guys that passed out the crosses. And I don't mean the ones holding the feet. I'm talking about <laughs> those two heads back there. So they're, they're beyond it. Uh, hallelujah. Now, I think that's everything that I was supposed to cover. Those are all important things. Good stuff. Good food. Absolutely. 
what is, what really is Christian living? Let's talk about that this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to open our eyes to see what you want us to see, our ears to hear what you would have to hear, have us to hear, our hearts to understand what you're doing in our lives and what you want to do in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for releasing the baggage from us today and empowering by Holy Spirit to bring forth heaven in us this very day. Breathe into us new life, new understanding, a new vivaciousness that we, the people of God, would walk and talk and be what you've made us to be. Lord, we thank you and praise you for life eternal. We praise you and thank you for what you're doing in our lives in this earth walk. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. you got the word right on that, praise God. Well, what is it? What is real Christian living? It seems that we throw that thought around quite a bit, uh, but the Bible gets real serious about it. Matthew 7, 14 says, For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few that find it. And as you know, if you've been around here for a while, one of my pet peeves is the word life, because there's several words in the Greek that are translated life, and they have completely different meanings, or at least they're not compatible with each other. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. This word life is the Greek word zoe, Z-O-E. And you don't have to have a Greek background <laughs> or scholarship. But zoe is the life of God. It's not plant life. It's not animal life. It's not human life. It's the life of God. It's the abundant life. It's the life, as Jesus said in John 10, 10, it's more abundant. It's eternal life. It's life that darkness cannot stand in the presence of. It's life that di disease and sickness and poverty are extinct in. It's the life of Jesus Christ. It's the life that Adam and Eve were created with before the fall that they gave away when they turned to their own sensibilities, if you can call it that, it wasn't very sensible, and rebelled to God. It's the life that Jesus Christ said that he came to give us. This pick up uh, in, in chapter 9 of John, Jesus had just healed a blind man. You should go back and read this, these whole chapters, 9 and 10, you ought to read them. In fact, that's your homework assignment. John 9, John 10, be sure you have them read by next Sunday. If you have both of those chapters read, then you get to go to heaven as well as you also have Jesus in your heart. Okay? Okay. After the blind man is healed, we read, and we ask the Holy Spirit questions yes. this week, by the way, chapters 9 and 10. When you read the Bible, ask the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? Would you show me what this means? Would you show me what you have for me in these passages? How many of you are able to do this, 9 and 10, this week? Okay. How many? Okay. Okay. Put them down. How many of you will? Okay. Okay. John, Kenneth, I want to see your hand up. John 9 and 10, the two chapters. Two chapters. Oh, my gosh. When we think about what we will talk about, be sure to pick up even more when you read it. Because set a place at the table for Holy Spirit to come in and take care. Right? Yes. He's real. A lot more real than the things you see right now. Amen. Praise God. John 9, 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Remember, Pharisees are not fair, you see? Right. Okay. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied. And I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees, that are not fair, you see, said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. 
But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. They still did not believe him that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Remember, this is the Pharisees talking here. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one who you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? Remember the ones besides Pharisees and Sadducees of the don't you sees? Okay. We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents, this is an important verse, verse 22. His parents said that because, this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. If your son or daughter does something underage, you're responsible for it. Okay, but he's out of age. They want to make it clear. Whatever he tells you, we're not responsible for this dude because he's a big boy now. His parents were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents says he's of age, asking. The second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God and tell the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see You want me to sing Amazing Grace for you? You already have it. Okay. Verse 26, then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. It sounds like Kelly, doesn't it? (laughs) Why did you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Oh, boy, that's a blow. (laughs) Oh, Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Talk about a put down. He's putting these guys in their place. Verse 32, nobody ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Boy, that's the best thing that could happen to him. Get thrown out of that religious place full of hypocrites. Verse 33, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believed and he worshiped him. This man achieved salvation right there. Lord, boss. I believe, I put my trust in you. And he worshiped him. Okay, very similar to what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. When he says, Lord, who is you? Who are you? Who are you, Lord? Yeah, and it, it shows, the Bible clearly shows that that's when he received the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Verse 39, Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Aren't you glad that Jesus judges us, shows us our insecurities, our sins, our transgressions, all the things that we need to deal with. He's judged us and he's told us to judge with righteous judgment. That means we do it in the right spirit and we tell the truth. There's a time for it. If you didn't make judgments, you wouldn't be here today because you made about a thousand yesterday. I'm not exaggerating. We have to do that. God gave us a brain. 
And some judgments are spiritual, and we're supposed to know what we're doing. We're supposed to get the telephone pole out of our eye so we can help the brother get his toothpick out of his eye. Uh Uh-huh, that's what the Bible says. And it says once you've done that, then you tell him what you need to tell him. That's very plain in Scripture. That's misquoted, 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 misquoted all the time. It's mostly by the world. Well, I don't want to judge you. You don't judge the person. You judge that behavior. If their behavior is robbing banks and holding people up, that's wrong. We, We don't beat around the bush and say, oh, I can't say that I can't judge you. No, that's the reason we have judges. That's the reason we have juries. That's the reason we have laws and a constitution. <laughs> that's the reason you have vanilla and chocolate and strawberry. Make a judgment. <laughs> and whatever else flavor you want to get. Verse 40. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Talk about judgment. Yeah, you're responsible for what you know. That's what he's saying. You're responsible for what you know. And I would add this, you're responsible for what you should know. Or could know. You know. Just because you've never heard the gospel doesn't mean you're not responsible for knowing the gospel or at least the God who made the gospel I don't care if you're on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean he will get himself to you if you ask him to amen getting quiet in this Methodist church (laughs) hallelujah John 10 verse 1 continuing you know there's not chapters and verse in the original manuscript it's a scroll okay Very truly, I I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Do you know Jesus knows you? He knows your name. Verse 4. When he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Remember, he said, if you don't understand the sower sows the word, you're not going to understand any of these things, parables. Mm -hmm. Verse 7, therefore Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved they will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have Zoe life and have it to the full. To the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his... Wrong word here though. The good shepherd lays down his suke life. Could be translated his soul, his mind, will, and emotion. That's what your soul is made of. So he says the good shepherd lays down his soul for the sheep. Now Jesus laid down his soul at the Garden of Gethsemane. He died a death in the soul so he could die a death openly on the cross. His will had to be Conjoined with the will of the Father. And I've done a bunch of teaching on spirit, soul, and body. We've done a series on five or six. They're available anytime. Because spirit, soul, and body, if you don't understand that, you're going to be cutting yourself way short on what you could understand. And to be honest, there's not a lot of really good teaching out there. Uh, It just happens to be one of our specialties. 
So it's good stuff. It's biblically solid. If you want to come in, we'll talk about it one-on-one. It's just a great, great opportunity for us to understand the battle that goes on in our mind that we're not perfect. And when we understand the difference between soul and spirit, like it says in Hebrews 4.12, then we understand why we've got this so we can conquer it. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Jesus didn't make this difficult. He just kind of hid some things for us. So there's other people who wouldn't know it mm-hmm. until they got in it, until they entered the gate. Yes. The gate's Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. you got to get a railroad ticket on the road to, to, to uh, uh, Zoe Life. That's all there is to it. See, once you enter eternal life, let me back it up. Once you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you enter eternal life right then and there in this life. Don't wait to heaven. It's too late. You make it now and you enter into it. You don't get the full benefits of it until you go to be with the Lord. Okay? But you get a lot of the benefits and you get a free train ride ticket on the train to the new kingdom. New heavens, new earth. Got to be a glorious day. But we've got things to do first. Okay, verses 11 to 18, Jesus talked about laying his life down. He talks about it over and over and over about the soul man. There are at least six times in the New Testament that the Bible says if you love your soul, you'll lose it. And it says in most translations, life, because it's suke. But he says if you hate your soul, you'll find life, Zoe life, eternal. I mention this quite often because it needs to be mentioned. So our human life... And our new creation life are two different things. Human life is our soul, mind, wind, emotions. Our new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, is our new spirit being. Before you're born again, you have, you're a two-part being, soul and body. When you're born again, you're a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Okay, that's enough said. I've probably confused a couple of people. That's the reason we have tapes for, have tapes for you. Online or on YouTube or on our website. Don't we, Cammy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell somebody right around you, you need to pick those up and look at, read them again. Or look at them again. Watch them again. Hear them again. <laughs> Do something with them. Inject them in you. Renew your mind. Praise God. So skip to verse 19 for time's sake. But you're going to read it anyway this week. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Verse 19. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, those are not the sayings of someone possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Come on. Hallelujah. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade the Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. I want to stop right there. No one will snatch them out of my hand. A lot of people take this verse and run off with it. They say, well, that means once saved, always saved. Well, I'm pretty close to believing that, but not 100%. How do you get saved? By grace through faith. Okay, you don't get saved by another man or woman. You get saved because of the grace of God, and you get saved because of your faith in the the man uh, in Jesus Christ. You trust in Jesus Christ. Okay, you can get out the same way. If you don't want to trust in Jesus anymore, you can get out of it. A man can't get you out of it. You can do whatever. 
They can burn you at the stake. They can stone you to death. A man cannot get you out of the kingdom, cannot snatch you out of it. But you can jump out of it if you want. I want you to remember that because that is a good biblical understanding of that verse. You read it like it is. Think about it. No man can snatch you out of my hand. Okay? That doesn't mean you can't quit. There are people that have done that. And the Bible talks about that. So some people take this one verse and say, Oh, once saved, always saved. Yep. And I heard a guy just a couple weeks ago in a video say the same thing. Yep. Yep. No man can saturate that once saved, always saved. You're going to take one verse and make a whole theological argument out of it? No, not around us, you're not. You have to prove it. Mouth two, three witnesses, let the word be established. Yeah. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. I and the Father are one. Jesus just declared he is God. Some people say Jesus never said that he was God. I'm going to probably preach on that here one of these days. i got about 15 verses or so out of the New Testament to disprove that. He didn't say it out here, I am God, although he does in other places. But he's the same as saying it. And just to substantiate that, we're going to pick it up in a few, few verses. Verse 31, again, the Jews picked up the stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? These dumb guys, man, they don't know how to handle Jesus. I mean, he's a lot years ahead of them. Verse 33, we are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you are a mere man. You who are a mere man claim to be God. Ditto. They said right here in Scripture that he claimed to be God, that he said it. So again, in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus is claimed to be God. Why is it so quiet? Okay, I'll go for that. Absorbing. Well, soak it up real good. Make a slurpy out of it. Verse 34. Jesus answered them, It is not written in... I, I, I think I want to just... Yeah, we'll just leave it off right there. goes into another thing. I meant to take that out of my notes. Okay, what really is Christian living? What really is Christian living? Is it just the cliche that we say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a good little Christian, so I'm living, I'm Christian living, I'm following Jesus. I pray over every other meal, sometimes all of them. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray for thee, my soul to keep. I'm living for Jesus. Hallelujah. I go to church three times a month, whether I need to or not. I, I, folks, I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm making fun with you. Because, you know, that one guy, his mother woke him up one morning. He, he's an adult man. And uh, she says, get up, get up, get up, get out of bed. Man, you can be late for church. He said, no, nah, mom, leave me alone. I'm going to sleep. Get up, son. It's time for church. We've got to leave. I, Mom, let me sleep. Son, you're the pastor. You got to get up and go to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. We see in the Old Testament, in fact, continuous stories, one after another, showing what happens to people who love their life, their suke. It starts off with a man and woman by the name of... Uh, Adam and Eve. And the, God has already told them, in the day you eat of that one tree, there are hundreds of trees out there. Maybe thousands, I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm not that old. Somebody got it. <laughs> he said, you can eat any tree you want. There's bananas, and there's kiwi fruit, and there's apples, and there's pineapples, and there's avocado, and da 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 and things we never heard of. But don't eat of that one stinking tree right there in the middle. Because the day that you eat of that tree, you'll die. 
You will die the day you eat of that tree, is what he told them. And guess what? One day, we don't know if it was the next day or 10,000 years later, but one day, probably wasn't too far, too long, the devil appeared to Eve in the form of a snake. Well, I don't believe in that. Well, good, you can go to hell if you want to. And said, did God say, did God say, probably had a little song, <laughs> might have been a rap, did God say, you know, <laughs> you know. He, he said it. And they go, hmm. And Eve goes, I see that that fruit is luscious to eat. Her, the lust of her eyes got the better of her. How do you look at a fruit and know it's good to eat? There's some things in this world that are ugly that are delicious. They're real delicious. There's some things in this world that look really good, and you don't want to touch them. Okay? So anyway, she took the apple, and her husband's standing right there, the Bible says. He wasn't somewhere off snoozing or working, either one. Right there with her. And she ate of that apple and gave it to him, and he ate of it. That guy was responsible for it. He let her do that. He'd already had a long talk with God about this stuff. What happened? They wanted to be as God, knowing good and evil, rather than getting it from God. That was their soul not their spirit, because they were spiritually alive from creation of them. Okay, so they loved their life. They had it made. They're in this garden, man. They've got everything you can think of. Probably had an 800-inch TV. You know, I mean, they had everything you can think of, and then some. <laughs> you know, it was perfecto. And uh, probably had, you know, Fresh, cold water running in one tap and hot water continued running in another one. I mean, you know, telling what all they had. <laughs> but they thought they had it made, and they really did. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to do it their way rather than God's way. And so sin entered one man and death by sin and then death to all men because that sin nature has been passed on in the blood. The life is in the blood. The suitcase is in the blood. It's been passed on to all generations. We're all, I don't care what color you are, you know, you can have pure blonde hair and be white as that woman I saw yesterday walking down the street. I thought, she's, she hadn't been out in the sun since she was born. <laughs> and she's going to get sunburned before she ends this, this block. She's, she's going to get burnt like a crispy critter. Or if you're like a lady I saw yesterday that was so black, it's beautiful black skin, and it's just like, oh, my gosh, it was ebony to the max. Anything in between, we're all one. We were made one, and we're going to end up one. You know, brothers and sisters. Now, people who aren't saved aren't brothers and sisters in this life. you got a choice to make it now. But but we have all been made one who are Christians by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's good. That's good news. Chris and I decided we're going to just have life together forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. Is that okay with you, Gail? You're going to be there too, aren't you? Okay. <laughs> that's what it's all about. But this, this my way doesn't make it. You know, and you can look at anything you want to. Look at Noah. Everybody was that way. We're just going to have drunk and get married and have a good time tonight. Well, I got news for you. There's a flood coming. What's that? <laughs> hey, ain't no flood. It never did rain before. It ain't going to rain now. Well, God's got a different story for you. <clears throat> and you go through to just pick anyone you want. Pick a, one of the wisest men that ever lived, Solomon. In his end, turned out walking in the soul, not doing the things that God has told him. He had the wisdom 
a few people that have ever walked this earth had. Some people say he's the smartest man ever. Well, I don't know about that, but he's one of them. It's pretty obvious. I mean, all, foreign nations all came to him just to listen to him talk. So what's the deal? Folks, we have a choice. Our way or his way. His way's better. And are we really doing Christian living? I love what Carol shared this morning. She came out there with a little, well, you know. <laughs> and then she told the way she took it. The sons of God will be led by the Spirit of God. I had something fairly recently that just it would make a lot of people shake. And I heard it. I thought, Lord, I'm not even out of peace. <laughs> it, I, I would think I would be a little nervous about this, at least a little. But I know that wouldn't help anything. Maybe that, oh, God series, Kelly. Yeah. Maybe it's stuck. There you go. Amen. When you fear God, yeah. you won't fear anything. Yeah. When you don't fear God, you'll fear everything. Yeah. And I just walked through smiling, Amen. singing a song, walking along, Jesus and me. Real Christian living, real life, Zoe, life of God. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit are part of your life with God. Starts with love. You can't love your neighbor as yourself without the Lord. I've got some pretty good neighbors, but they are not perfect. And I'm not perfect. A, guy, a couple moved in across the street from me from Arkansas, and I still love them. He put an Arkansas flag out in front of his house. I said, oh, my gosh, I really have to pray for you more. It is funny. There's a theme all the way through the Bible. Some of it they make points, and some of it they don't. But the Bible says in many places, the younger shall lead the older. And you say, well, okay, give me an example. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, it's, it's kind of subliminal in um, uh, Adam and Eve. Cain was the older one. Seth was the leader. The one that was a replacement for Abel. One that's really stressed is Jacob and Esau. Esau stuck a leg out and they tied a thread on it to designate him as the older one. But then Jacob came out. I almost said shoot. <laughs> that wouldn't be very appropriate, would it? Okay. Came out, and so he was actually the younger child. So Esau had the birthright, okay? And the birthright gets a double portion, okay? So if you have two kids, they divide it by three, and the oldest one, older one gets two, and the younger one one. If you have ten kids, they divide it by elevenths, and the oldest one gets two elevenths, and the other... Get, get theirs. Other ten get theirs. Okay. We got that straight. The point being, Esau was supposed, he had the birthright, and Esau had the double portion, okay, and Jacob, although he was a conniver, got that. You know why? Because Esau wanted a bowl of soup. He wanted a bowl of soup. I don't even know if it was Campbell's or what brand it was, but anyway, he, he wanted that, that soup. And so he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. And then later on, he was, oh my goodness, look what I did. They had more than one can of soup there. Yeah, well, Jacob connived his way. The word Jacob actually means deceiver. Okay, later, that's the reason he was changed to Israel. His name became Israel once he got his act together. Yep. Yeah. But 
his younger brother, excuse me, his older brother served him. The younger brother got the deal, got the package. How many of us have sold our birthrights? There's one thing that we have that Esau didn't have, and that's the mercy seat. We have mercy. We've blown it, and God forgave us. All we have to do is ask for that forgiveness, and he applies the blood of Jesus Christ on our hearts, on our minds, on our lives, and cuts off the past and says, yep, it's gone, that's it, next. That's the life that we can walk in forgiveness. We can walk in freedom. We can walk in the things that God has for us, not thinking about what we did last week, last year, or 20 years ago, or 50 years ago. Man, if I wanted to think about all the stuff I've ever done, I would go, and you would too. Even Kelly. He's not perfect. Dion, do you know that he's not perfect? <laughs> He's got you deceived. <laughs> he got that spirit of Jacob on him. <laughs> Freedom. Life to the fullest. Abundance. A billion dollars won't give you freedom. Ten billion won't give you peace. Fifty billion won't give you joy. Oh, it's nice to have Abundance, like food to eat, clothes to wear, but most of all, what's on, you know, on the inside? The inside that God does when we're a new spirit creation. And then, then if we re renew our minds and listen to him, then guess what? He shifts the emphasis from me to him. Now, what did we talk about a little bit earlier? The soul guy. Remember that old song, Soul Man? You don't want to be that soul man. You don't want to be, you don't want to be justified, sanctified. <laughs> you want me to sing it for you? <laughs> we might take a vote on that. We might lose on that one. <laughs> the soul man has got to be put in proper perspective. Okay, There were others, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were uh, the sons of uh, Jacob. And uh, Joseph was involved in that situation, you know. And that was his two sons. And when Israel, or excuse me, it's, he's Israel now, it's not Jacob any longer, same guy. When Israel laid hands, he laid hands like this on the two kids. This was supposed to be the older one, and this is supposed to be the younger ones, and he goes like that. So uh, made a cross, didn't he? Yeah. Changed lives. The older shall bow to the younger. The soul shall bow to the spirit. Yes. You're first a soul in a body, and then when you're born again, you become a spirit, spirit soul and body, and the key to Christian living is to die to that old guy and live to the new guy yeah. and take the emphasis off you, me, yeah. and put the emphasis on Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jesus wants you fulfilled more than you'll ever be able to think what fulfillment is yeah. because that's where real freedom comes. That's where the stress of me being the mm -mm, this and that, that comes off. Yeah. It's not there anymore. And, and your, your wants and your druthers, they change, they shift gears. You know, instead of me wanting to see what's good for me, I want to see what's good for you. Yes. And you do the same. Yes. What's good? I don't know. What's good for Sarge? I care about that. Yes. Me will be fine. You know? What's good for Brad? What's good for Doris? Yes. That's where I can lay down my life for you. That's where you can lay down your life for me. Suke. Suke. Once you have the Zoe, you don't have to worry about the Suke. Just keep him on top. 
Now, some of you may not be getting this. You need to listen again later on. Because the Holy Spirit will make it plain and clear to you. And you'll go, got it. The Word of God, that's the reason Romans 12 tells us we must renew our mind to the good and perfect will of God so that we can prove what's the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's the reason Hebrews 4, 12, and 13 says that the Word of God is sharp and powerful, quick and powerful, and alive and powerful is what it is, alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Is it a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart? Mm-hmm. Breaks all the stuff up. It is rather easy for us to pick out people in recent history, people who call themselves Christians and those who did not. It's easy for us to sit back and say something like, yep, I knew it, or do you know what they did, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Frankly, the list of people calling upon the name of Jesus is endless in history as well as current who have blown it, and you may be on that list. But that doesn't count today if you're repentant. And have left and asked Jesus to help you walk through that. Because brothers and sisters in the Lord have forgiven you. If not, that thing's going to come on them. People throw the word life around like it's candy. While missing being a recipient of the free grace of God. And totally trusting in the gate. Jesus Christ. I'm going to present to you kind of a summary of what we may look like different kinds of Christians or people who call themselves Christians. And, and this is not to pick on anybody, but it's just to kind of give us a little way to discern and to maybe be more aware of what we should be looking at uh, in the mirror. Number one, to make believe Christian. They possibly have head knowledge. And they may even know a lot of stuff. But they're missing on fidelity. And there's a, there's a stream of people who call themselves Christians who are progressives, progressive Christians. And they don't believe in the same Jesus that we do. They tell you they do, but they don't. All you have to do is what about Jesus? And they'll tell you what they think about Jesus. It may shock you. Number two, it's the nominal or carnal Christians. The Bible calls it carnal. Nominal is probably a little better word for us. They're saved by faith, but they're not walking by faith. They may believe to some extent and agree, but they'll have a worldly worldview they're not growing in Christ. And they might be in church, mostly for, you know, I'm supposed to go to church or I'm supposed to attend church, so I go to church. You with me so far? Number three, well-meaning Christians. They attend church once a week, most weeks. They pray a little. When they probably need something, go to God for him. They're not involved in scripture reading or understanding. And they don't contribute to the overall work of Christ. They mean well. These people could be saved or not. Who knows? They could be really good people. Number four, spirit-led Christians. They walk in all they know or could know. They're forgiven. They make mistakes. They call upon the name and the blood. And they're forgiven. They don't walk in condemnation. They don't walk with a bunch of baggage because they know the one who cuts them loose for them. They're spirit-filled. They're spirit-led. They talk more about Jesus than they do themselves. Yes. And just keep in mind, no one's perfect. Okay? No one's perfect. Pastor Dan, you're really being tough. 
Well, did Jesus have it tough? How about Paul? Did he have it tough? How about a bunch of others in history? How about even today in history? Making history. Do some people have it tough? Christianity's not for girls and boys. It's for men and women. People don't want to stand. And the men and women can be eight years old as far as that goes. Men and women of God. There's a call of God to go through the gate of Christianity. Jesus Christ. It's not having knowledge of Him in your head. It's having Him as your Lord. Who you put your trust in. I have a special challenge to, to the men in Father's Day today. And anybody that ever listens to this message, there's never a better time that we have to be alive. Forget the past, put your hand to the plow, and head towards the high calling and mark of Christ Jesus. Guys, we can do this. The world needs you. When the men rise up, to be men of God, the world changes. Guys, where are you in the kingdom building process? That's the question I challenge to ask yourself. God is a generational God. It's all through the Bible. Abraham and Isaac, Abraham and the rest, Isaac and Jacob, Israel. Why do you suppose the Bible's full of begats? Every generation stands on the previous generation's shoulders. Will we make ours wide enough for them to begin with a firm foundation in life? There is a truth found throughout the Bible. And we talked about it a while ago. The younger shall rule over the older. Maybe you don't have biological children. Maybe you've never been married. Maybe you married and never had physical children, biological children. Maybe you've messed up. Maybe you have, there's a breach between you and your earthly parents. Maybe you've never fully trusted in and made Jesus your Lord. What can I say? There are these and a million other excuses that keep us from being everything that God has made us to be. Together we have an opportunity to change the world one person at a time. Mylon Lefevre, back in the 80s, Christian musician, did a song one by one. W-O-N by O-N-E. Great meaning. This is the challenge. You know, Christian living is laying your life down for someone else. And the only true thing, eternal life, which begins in this earth life of ours. Jesus declared himself as the gate. There is a train to get on. To go to the next station. Yes. There's a train that has a great trip on it. So we get on that, that train that Jesus has let us walk through the gate. And we ride that train for the rest of this life. And it's a great trip. It's the best trip that there is. Oh, sometimes there's train wrecks. And sometimes... You know, you're in that train. I remember train when I was a little boy, and we'd go by the, on the side of a hill. Actually, it was a mountain. You, you look out, and you, all you can see is nothing <laughs> real well. It's like, uh, uh, are, are we off the track? <laughs> no, just going through a time. Sometimes there's things there. And then, you know, I went with my mother quite a few times on trains back and forth. Where our dad, my dad was working, and we were visiting uh, relatives out of state. And she'd say, this train goes by here every day. Isn't it great? Look, down, look out the window and see how great it is. Struggles, cars break down. Guess what? <laughs> you get blessed. Amen. You know, you're supposed to have a big bill. That's supposed to cost you, oof, alternator. You know what service people charge for work these days? 
well over hundred dollars an hour at any automotive place you go. Yeah. <laughs> what it would charge to get a brand new Infinity and go to Florida and back? <laughs> Not going to be twenty dollars a day and five cents a mile. Yeah. Favor of God. Mm-hmm. He does it. He does it when you least expect it. He does it when he doesn't have to. But like the Israelites, they like to do a lot of murmuring and complaining. And that's one that I've always tried to repent of. When I've said something, oh, Lord, I didn't mean that. I'm not going to be a murmuring complainer by your grace. I want to be a real Christian. And I can only be that because God's empowering me by his grace to be that. I cannot do it myself. I cannot be it except the Holy Spirit living through me. And we yield to him that he brings forth his promises, his truth, his reality, his life. And no matter what the situation, if we, if we come out of it or if we go right through it, that grace will take us right through it. I just heard a testimony yesterday. I was telling Brad Dion this morning. Uh, two and a half hour testimony about somebody that I've known for 30 years. He came into town. He's a Texan. Don't hold that against him. He came into town and gave me a testimony about how this severe burns he got. Severe burns he got. Severe to the point his sister got a phone call from the doctor and says, you need to come in and say your goodbyes. And he gave me, he gave me, he's one of these guys that tells you every detail. He told me every detail. But my gosh, what God had done. And when somebody would say, this isn't going to work, or they told him that once he started to rehab and got the skin back on and everything, you know, growing, they wanted to put skin grafts. He said, no, I don't want them. I don't need them. I serve the living God. And he kept saying, I serve the living God. I serve the living God. That was his big deal going through this whole situation. I must have heard it 50 times yesterday. And it's like, he was so emphatic. He said, I've got a testimony and I'm going to tell it everywhere I go. How how he was rescued from that. He still had a lot of adversity to go through. And they said, well, it's going to be six to 12 weeks. You learn how to walk right again. Because he had some kind of infection or disease that came through because of the smoke inhalation even after he was up and around some. He, I mean, he went over detail to detail to detail. I saw his picture that his sister took when he was in the hospital. Not very sweet looking. In fact, it looks like a horror flick. They call his sister, lives in Nashville. He's in Texas. Call him Nashville says, you need to get here and say your goodbye. You know what his sister said? Casey's not going anywhere. Amen. How'd you like to have a sister like that? Yes. Speaking the word of faith over you. He's not going anywhere. That's pretty cool. That's what you need when you're in a pinch. There's other believers to come alongside and believe the same thing you believe. Their mother used to minister uh, in Mexico. And it... In fact, he lived in Mexico. He fairly fluent in Spanish for a while when he was growing up. Stories like that, you can't make them up. The movie that you're going to see Wednesday, two Wednesdays, you're going to see some incredible stories about people, hurt lives, and how God puts them back together. When we join together in the kingdom, God will do things. Some of them are very little to you, but to somebody, or very little to somebody else, but they may be huge to you. Just to know the hand of God that He's in the miracle business, M I R A C L E. He does it today. The people that say God doesn't do those things anymore, well, if that's what you believe, that's what you're going to get. We all we do is take the promises, the New Testament's full of them. <coughs> you're different you're salt you're light you're different 
You glow in the spirit realm. You lay hands on the sick. You speak the words of life. You have the love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance against there is no law. That's the kind of stuff that we live as Christians. That's who we are because He made us. Christians, let me say two other things. Number one, this includes every woman, okay? I'm not cutting the women short this Father's Day so you don't get to be, you know, honored, <laughs> pampered today. But every man has come from a woman. Don't you forget it. Mm-hmm. Women make little boys into men. Don't you forget it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Some people are wanting to do the walk of faith. Some people are saying, okay, if this Christian stuff is real, then how do I walk it? Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I who lives, but Christ living in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. He laid down his life for the sheep. I are a sheep. (laughs) That one song we sing, I am Adam, I am Eve. That's talking about the problem. Now we talk about the answer. Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Folks, We need to cut off the facade and start being injected with who God says we are. Pride. God resists the proud. Stands against the proud. But gives grace to the humble. Gives the power to be that which you can't do yourself to those who see themselves as God sees them. See, we take the scriptures and we unwrap it and we go, oh my goodness, I've been missing it. Mm -hmm. When I got a hold of Galatians 2.20 some years ago, I saw a different life. And that life that I lived, the reason I'm on earth is to help equip you to reach others. Mm -hmm. That's that's it. Now that's broad-based. There's a lot to it. Mm -hmm. But I get to work with some beautiful people. Got some sitting on the front row, got some back there on the tables, and all in between. Let's bow. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for eternal life, the life of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Father, thank you for doing everything that you're doing in our lives. And Father, we want to be a pleasing, sweet-smelling savor to you. We want to give up our lives so we can walk in your life. We want to die to ourselves and live unto you. We submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We bow our knee to the King of kings, the Lord of glory, the Lamb of God, the bright morning star, the first, the last, the alpha, the omega, the Messiah, the Messiah Yeshua. We thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name. Now, in an attitude of prayer, let us continue. Maybe you need to get on the train. Maybe you've been on the train and you got one foot hanging off a little bit. Today's your day. Let's take care of that. Get on the train. Stay on the train. Go see the scenery. Enjoy the ride. The train will eventually appear at the gates of heaven. But until then, we've got a train to ride. And it's already in the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God train. 
Jesus is the gate. He's standing there at the gate and saying, On board! If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is your opportunity to walk through the gate of Christ. He's tugging at your heart because He loves you. He proved it when He went to the cross and He proved everything that He said and did by His resurrection, the raising from the dead. He's done everything necessary for, in order to facilitate the kingdom may manifest in us in the name of Jesus. I would ask you today, if you're in this building or if you're on video, however you're listening to this message, I would ask you today, where are you with Jesus? Where should you be? It's an opportunity to restore and refresh your relationship with Jesus Christ or it's your opportunity to enter the kingdom through the gate, Jesus Christ. You need to be able to confess that Jesus was raised from the dead and call him your boss or Lord. Believing in the heart is made into righteousness and confession of the mouth is made into salvation, Romans 10, 9 and 10. So I'd ask you right where you are, I don't care if you're in, in your living room and you're the only person there. I don't care if you're, this is in a, in a bar someplace <laughs> that somebody accidentally was listening to. Whatever it is. If you want Jesus right now, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Raise your hand. Praise God. Praise God. How about it on YouTube? How about it on video? Today's your day. It's as real today. And God's out there with you. And He's tugging at your heart. And He's saying, would you come to me, all you that heavy labor? I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Call upon the name. Anyone today in this room? Praise God. Okay. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Pastor Kelly. Oh, come on up. Come on. I want to talk about these just for a minute. It's okay. You can come up here with me. I don't buy it. We have a track published that we will be able to put in your hands today. These tracks, I believe, are a great, great gate opener. And it's got, uh, on the front of it, it says, where will you be tomorrow? Where will you be tomorrow? Hey, good question. So glad you asked. A good question to ask yourself. Where will you be tomorrow? Should give us all something to ask ourselves each and every day. Just think about it. Where will you be tomorrow? Where will you be next week? Where will you be next year? In five years, in ten years, and the big one, where will you be in eternity? Thousands of earth lives from now. A few people are sure. However, others want to think they know but don't. Yeah. Many others don't have that, any idea. Some don't even want to know. Mm -hmm. Without a vision and understanding of all these tomorrows, we have nothing to anticipate. That produces little to no confidence or security, which means little hope, joy, or peace. We invite you to bring us your unanswered questions about your tomorrows. After all, what really counts about your tomorrows are finding the right answers. Church of tomorrow. Awesome. Awesome. Cheers, sir. Amen. Hallelujah. So make sure that before you leave, I've got Sarge back there, that he's going to uh, give everyone at least one. But if you want more than one, you know, grab hold of them. We've got plenty of them. And we believe that this is going to be a very impactful thing uh, for people's lives. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Look at someone else and say, sounds pretty good. All right. I'm going to be calling out uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 as we uh, uh, focus on uh, giving today. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth. What are you going to honor the Lord with? 
Okay? Every one of you are wealthy. Yeah? Hallelujah. I'm reminded of the, the woman with, with uh, the, the mites. Okay? Didn't have very much, but she had. She was still wealthy. And what did God's word say that she gave? She gave everything she had. Not what she didn't have, but what she did have. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Your barns will be filled overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. I don't see how you can get any better than, than that. Amen. Hallelujah. So when you honor the Lord with your wealth, the first fruits, okay, God will always, okay, uh, be the supplier. It's who he is. It's his very nature. Okay, to be the provider. Look at your neighbor and say, he is my provider. It reminds me of a song from years ago. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Yeah, I can remember that. So I want you to remember when you give, okay, bring it. To, uh, I want you to be uh, reminded we can give, you know, online. We can give text to give. We can give uh, uh, in person, you know, with the envelopes there in the back. Uh, in addition, some other announcements. This Wednesday, everyone say this Wednesday. We're going to have a video, okay? We've just finished with the Awe of God book, and now we're going to see the arm of God at work, okay, in this video. It's going to be amazing. You don't want to uh, uh, be just, you know, uh, missing out on something, okay? When this video is going to be very helpful for you, and it's going to open your eyes uh, to see God in yet a different way. We like to see God with great big, you know, and look through the space and see further and further and further and further and further. Well, how about taking it the opposite dire uh, direction, okay, and looking at it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and it never ends. Never ends. <laughs> Uh, also, I want to remind you, this next Sunday, everyone say, this next Sunday, a most impacting man of God has impacted me personally uh, many a time since I have gotten to know him. Uh, Dr. Richard Ely is going to be in the house this next Sunday. Please come, 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 come. Bring others with you. Uh, he is one of the overseer, uh, one of the board members of Church of Tomorrow, and we're going to be ordaining him as uh, an elder of this church. Uh, he's a sweet man, powerful man, very wise, filled with the wonderful spirit of God. You uh, don't want to miss that. Amen. Hallelujah. And then the following Wednesday on June the 28th, we're going to show a video called Show Me the Father. Show Me the Father. And you want not want to miss that as well. It's, a, it's going to be a great blessing for everyone. Everyone stand, please. Hallelujah. Don't forget those wonderful uh, things in the back, those uh, tracks. Okay. And have them available. Okay. Have them available, you know, to when you go around in different places. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the word that has been shared today. Thank you, Lord, that you, O oh Lord, give us privilege and honor to take what has been given to us and we then release it as your Holy Ghost shows us. We just are so thankful for the leadership of your spirit. Hallelujah. As we leave, Hallelujah. As we go, as we come, as we uh, gather together, Father, uh, everywhere, I just thank you that you are our everything. And we so appreciate you and love you and adore you. And we will serve you all of our days. And we praise you for the results of it in the mighty name of Jesus. You know what? There are some crosses left, okay? There are some crosses left on those um, interesting antlers back there, okay? And so if anyone has any kind of a, a, a father that they know of nearby or in their family uh, that they would like to have one, okay, uh, take it, okay? If you're a, or if you're not a father, okay, but you know of a young man who need, you think might need to, a cross, uh, just kind of make sure they might know Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that way they can actually testify of the good things of God when someone asks what that's about. Amen? Because we live in a society now where a lot of people may not know what that is anymore. 
So, hallelujah. We dismiss you in the name of Jesus. Go in the grace and the love and the power and the love of God in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.